Hey everybody, this episode is exclusively brought to you by an amazing record label called The Native Sound. Specifically, their two releases from Val and Koji. For more information on that, visit thenativesound.com. Now on with the show. Up, everybody! I don't know why I wanted to sing that one, but I'm your host, Ray Harkins, and welcome to another episode of 100 Words or Less, the podcast. Thank you very much for joining. I have a feeling this is going to be the first episode for a lot of people because I have a very, very special guest that is popular in worlds outside of the context of music and punk and hardcore and whatever you want to call it. Anyways, the gentleman I have on today is Mr. Roman Mars. He is the host for basically one of my favorite podcasts out there right now, 99% Invisible. And I was extremely excited that we were able to hook this interview up. It's really special for me because, uh, yeah, I just admire his work so much. So more on him in a minute. Let's get some business stuff out of the way, and then uh, we'll be able to uh, dig into the rest of the show. First and foremost, The Native Sound. They are a record label. You heard me mention them at the top of the show. They have incredible things going on. Two releases I want to highlight in particular. First is a band called Vow. They're here from L.A. They have sounds that are similar to like Cocteau Twins or, or Purity Ring or even Churches. It has a nice atmospheric slash electronic thing going on. Nick Steinhardt, a future guest on this show, who is the guitarist of a band called Touche Amore. He contributed to the EP, did the artwork. Basically, this band is on the cusp of something big and cool. And I'm very excited that the label decided to partner up with us and have you check out a song. So here is a song from them, and you can check it out, and I'll be back in a second. Pretty rad, right? That's what I'm talking about. I really enjoy it. I pre-ordered the EP. You should as well. But before I plug the pre-order info, Koji should be a guest on the show. I haven't had him on yet, and I should, but he is an incredible musician out of the East Coast, Pennsylvania area. The Native Sound released their first EP on vinyl for the very first time. It's called Some Small Way. It's on a 12-inch, 180-gram vinyl, very, very high-quality stuff. I got my pre-order in the mail about a week or two ago. Amazing stuff. So pick up both of these releases because guess what? The gentleman that runs the label has decided to give you, the listener, a coupon code. So type in 100 words at the website, and you'll be able to get 10% off your order. And it's like, oh, 10%, whatever. No, it's a big deal, because this is an independent label. He doesn't just give discounts to everybody. Please, if you do this, you support the show. Both of these releases are great, and then you can check out a bunch of other stuff he has going on, releases from John Vanderslice, Miserable, King Woman, Grazing, and so much more. Do all of this at thenativesound.com. Remember, 100 words for 10% off. There you go. Do it. And for some other business, I'd like to give a shout out to two specific people who left some awesome reviews on iTunes. Culty Man, and he said something super flattering. Dude, this is really great, and I am so glad you're doing this. I feel like that was like a digital high five, and I really appreciate that. And then a person, J-U, money sign, plus one. They said, do a whole episode of reviews and suggestions, which I did. Check it out, like three or four episodes ago. If you want some good music, movies, pop culture stuff, dive back in. I want to say it's three episodes ago. It's a bonus episode, so check it out. Visit the website, 100wordspodcast.com, our media partner, propertyofzack.com. 
And here, let's just let's dive into this. So, like I said, Roman Mars is the host of 99% Invisible. I mean, it's a pretty big deal because it's one of the top 10 podcasts in iTunes. The show is incredible. It talks about architecture. It talks about the world around us. It talks about paying attention to stuff that is really, really small and many people would define as inconsequential, but it just reveals so much about that particular either building or historical context. I I can't say enough good things about it. And I emailed Roman and this was, uh, you know, a while ago. And then it took him a few months to get back to me. But he said, hey, this sounds cool because I knew he'd come from a similar background as a lot of us have in the punk and hardcore independent music community. So I was excited to kind of, you know, dig into that and see where, where it came from because so much of his program is rooted in the DIY ethics because, I mean, he's put together this amazing thing called Radiotopia. He was able to do an amazing Kickstarter and be able to fund a lot of these programs and radio shows that typically would go by unnoticed. So anyways, enough praises of him. <laughs> it was a great conversation. He even did his radio voice for me, which I was super, super stoked on. So here's Roman Mars, and I will talk to you after. I usually start these things off with just my own personal sort of entry point to what it is that you are and what you're doing. I just heard these fleeting references, and like you said, it's kind of a, a calling card whenever... <laughs> You're speaking to an audience that doesn't have the context for, you know, even a band like the Misfits or Black Flag or anything like that. They've right. maybe heard of them. It doesn't mean anything to them. I was already listening to the podcast prior to see, you know, seeing those, uh, like you said, those calling cards flying out there. And then I just, the, the thing that endeared me towards the show the most was the fact that, I mean, I, like you, have no background in architecture whatsoever. Buildings are pretty. That's basically the best <laughs> description I could have. Uh, but it was a curiosity factor and like the role that you play in the show of just being like, I, I'm like you. I don't know anything about this. So let's go on this journey together. Um, I presume that was basically, I mean, from when I began listening to your show, that was always kind of the role that you filled. That was very deliberate on your part. Yeah. An interested person because you would, the the show is trying to get people to care about these things that are often pretty mundane and every day. And so you have to have this interested party kind of pulling you along and saying, no, 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 really pay attention. This is, this is cool. And so often that person is the interview subject. Like they can do that role and they can be great at that role. Sometimes that role is my role, you know, just to to get people, you know, grab them by the collar and say, oh, this is neat. You have to really pay attention here. Um, and, I, and I like that, you know, uh, it, it's it's funny. I mean, the, the, I think part of the show works in the way that I can talk to people about it is that I can find the thing that a person who doesn't have that much of interest in architecture would grab onto. Usually it's not the most important thing about a building. It's just the neatest thing about a building. But being able to tell what that thing is, usually, you know, sort of my position as a person who doesn't know all that much (laughs) about these things uh, helps me find that thing. Because architects are very into what is important and the legacy of things. And um, and I have much more knowledge of that now, but I think I'm rooted in the sort of journalism world much more where I can find the, the neat thing that gets people ex- excited. So, um, but I mean, now at this point, I've been doing the show for four years. I, I know a fair amount about architecture and design at this point. You know yeah, I mean? yeah. Like it comes, <laughs> it comes to you, at the, you know, like over time. But totally. when I entered into it, it was just. I was just interested, and that that's really kind of all it takes. I think I mean that's a really important point because when you you yourself are looking at something with quote unquote fresh eyes and not a mm-hmm. prof, not a professional lean, you pay attention to things that may not be important to the original creator or the person putting forth that piece of art in general. So it's like, oh yeah, I never even thought about a person <laughs> would would look at that and think that that part is cool when I really spent no time whatsoever in that. But then the other thing that I spent years on was like, hey, why didn't you, you miss that? <laughs> I always tell people when they're trying to make stories, important is the least interesting form of interesting. So if you lead with the importance of something, you know, that gets you somewhere with people, but really what you need to do is pick out a specific detail, tell a narrative, that hooks people. Being important just kind of doesn't do it to yeah. me. 
It's because you know, there's lots of things that are more important, you know, like, yeah, and, and, you know, you can always get worked up about any number of things that are that are way more important. Your family's more important. You know, like people starving is more important than, you know, us having gadgets and good looking flags and, you know, things So like important is is um, is is not a good resting place. But that's where most discussions about architecture uh, seemed to be when I found them. It's like the, what the role of somebody important in the world was and modernism and, you know, and, and, and these types of revivals and things like that. And and that was n- never my thing. I, I think important is a waste of time. Right, right, right. I, I'm going to dive right in immediately to the idea of you having exposure to, you know, independent music and that sort of stuff. When did that kind of percolate into your life? I, I view you know, as a tangential subject, the idea, I mean, podcasts in and of itself, there's a correlation between that this medium and being a terrible punk band playing, you know, in front of 20 <laughs> people. Like it's such a, yeah. uh, it's such a vibrant medium for that. And so, uh, yeah. So walk me through kind of, you know, where you got your, your first exposure to that sort of stuff. And, you know, did you, uh, uh, you know, dive right in immediately or, you know, what was your, what was your journey with that? Well, I had the great good fortune of having, a cool older sister. Oh, the which, per- perfect gateway, my friend. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, you cannot overestimate that what that does to you. So, so my sister is about five years older than me and we're very close. So my gateway was pretty, you know, music was always really important to me, but I think it was sort of mid early eighties, kind of new wave college rock. Sure. Was what they called it then. And then it was called alternative, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and stuff like that. So it was really, you know, the sort of melodic stuff that you would hear on the radio every once in a while. Like you, you would hear, you know, the REM and uh, NXS and Cure and things like that. The, the you know, Smiths, th- things like that. I was, I was very much into the just the pop, um, new wave type stuff. Sure. And then, and then, sort of, I, I sort of, I quickly kind of surpassed her in the, um, in the realm as the music got more obscure and and harder, essentially. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, you know, it just fit our temperament more. She was never really that angry and I felt angry all the time. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You were like, Hey, so you've kind of just scratched my surface. Uh, I need to get the harder stuff. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so that's when it kind of started. And it started with, you know, that's pretty typical. Uh, like, well, the first thing I started to do was I would get tapes from her. Um, she went to Wittenberg university in Ohio and I get tapes from her of like radio shows that that college kids would do mm-hmm. and then and get the names written out but I, they wouldn't always be accurate or whatever <laughs> <laughs> and so i remember the first time i heard palehead which is the um oh, yeah. ministry minor threat you know kind of thing uh, Ian mckay thing mm-hmm. it, i thought it was philhead by the way that somebody <laughs> you know it's you know but it was p it, but the cursive a sort of blended into the p and i and i just and i had no idea what it was like i had no idea the Where provenance. to find it? Yeah, yeah. Well, I had no idea the provenance of the band. Like I had no idea what Ministry and Minor Threat were. It just seemed like this. It was just this. It was I will refuse. It was like on this tape that was you know not la- you know not properly labeled. It wasn't back announced on the radio. Mm-hmm. I actually don't even know how it got on the radio because it has a swear word. Swear word, right? <laughs> but and it was just completely out of the blue. Like I had no reference for it. And I loved it. I loved that song so much. Mm-hmm. And um, and then I sort of found it, you know, Minor Threat, found all these other things. And then I found my world at that point, which was kind of 14 or 15. Okay. Was was the age that that was for me. And where were you, uh, where were you coming up? Where were you raised? At that point, I was, I lived in central Ohio. I lived outside of Columbus. And so the, 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 the cultural center of the universe. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> what I would do is on the weekends, I had uh, one other friend who was into um, this type of music with me. We would go in uh, on the weekends. My mom would, would drive us to High Street where the university was. And she would sit in the gas station, which had a couple of you know tables, like an AM, PM type station, drink coffee. And we would hit all the record stores and buy you know everything we could that we were interested in. And really after the discovery of a, you know, of minor threat in those, my main line was Discord. I bought everything on Discord mm-hmm. from probably, you know, like... 89 on um and 
that that was that was my that was my major drug of choice at that point. Sure, sure. For people like you and I who obviously have a, a, a rich history in regards to you know what Discord means uh, and is, and just the uh, that model of like, hey, so we'll exist in this this capitalist world of you know the music industry, so to speak. But we're just going to kind of do our things by our own rules. And yeah, of course, like Fugazi's famous for the $5 shows and, um, you know, the fact that you could uh, call up the Discord house and talk to Ian. Um, <laughs> so what was it? Like you said, it was just the sort of uh, angst that that drew you into a lot of the uh, the aggressive punk and obviously the the DIY ethics that you were starting to, you know, see in that music. Yeah, I liked it. I liked the idea of there being a community. I liked that they were all kind of, part of each other. I don't, I mean, I still don't even know to this day. I've never explored it very much. I don't know people in that scene personally. Right. Like I never got to know them really. Mm-hmm. I booked, when I got to college, I began booking those bands because they were incredibly cheap <laughs> and, they would, <laughs> they would, and they would play and like, you know, 10 of us would really care. And then a few other people would show up. Um, but they were superstars to us, you know, like booking Shudder to Think or the Holy Rollers or I'm trying to think of who else came around that time. But those Discord bands were, to me, they were just like superstars. Yeah, um, that, was the, that was the pinnacle. <laughs> yeah, I, just, I couldn't believe it that they would come, you know. You know, there was just something, I just felt something about it. I didn't love everyone, you know, like every band. But I would always give them a try. And I just like that as a curation, the idea of that. Uh, that scene. Yeah, you could trust what would come out on that, whether or not you would, it would specifically identify with it. You would have yeah. the concept of like, okay, well, this is trusted by these people, so I, I should give it a chance. Yeah, I like what they were trying to do. I liked, particularly with Fugazi, they were ahead of me. You know, I, I almost never liked the new album that came out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. And then And then I would love it. And that was always impressive to me. And they didn't rest. Whereas, you know, I loved a lot of, um, you know, Northern California, you know, East Bay punk too. Mm -hmm. And, um, but as, you know, as joyful and as marvelous, as much as I loved those bands, they don't really challenge you all that much. Sure. No, no, there's, there's, it it is interesting. I've always, the, the geographic nature in which the bands are contained, how you can see where it's like, you know, the Washington DC area, it, bands were serious and then yeah. you, you obviously see you know bands like you know jawbreaker and green day and it's like yeah they're you know they're emotionally serious but they're not doing much else beyond that like <laughs> well there's a there's a certain thing about art is like this balance between comfort and challenge mm-hmm. you know and so where you like that where, where you like that meter in, in that ratio is kind of up to you. And sometimes I really like more comfort than challenge. And then sometimes I really like more challenge than, than comfort. Right. And it just was, there was something about the nature of those bands, especially the kind of the later ones, even after the sort of the, the revolution summer type bands, the, the ones that were like the, what I would consider the, the, the sort of fourth, third or fourth wave of them, like Jawbox, and then later like Smart One Crazy and, and stuff like that, where I was just kind of blown away by all the things they did and sort of, you know, they didn't sound like minor threat. And and that was, and that was fine. I I didn't need them to sound like minor threat anymore. Right. But but I remember particularly the, the, um, the second John box album novelty, I kind of hated it. I would, but for some reason it just stuck in my brain and I would play it over and over and over again. There was something about it that I, I kind of couldn't get enough of, even though I didn't get it in a lot of ways. (laughs) Right. And then it just locked in and became what I thought was just a masterpiece. And I remember when they signed to Atlantic and they put out their first, and I was anticipating, you know, their first album with Atlantic and, and nervously anticipating because at that time that stuff really mattered. Oh know? dude, you're a, you, that, at that, at that point, the band was a sellout. You're done. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. I mean, it was never, that was never quite as hardcore about that sort of thing yeah. to, to me. And, and I do think that probably their first Atlantic album is their best album a it made me really happy because i just loved it it did tweak sort of my you know my opinion about how this type of stuff could or should work yeah know, in, the, in the world you know as you were you said immersing yourself within sort of this culture and really identifying with a lot of the bands musically and um you know aesthetically and uh, politically 
you know, how deep did you, you know, dive into it in regards to like, you know, did you want to play in bands? Like, did you have a history in, in that sort of realm or were you uh, only interested in kind of being, you know, <laughs> behind a the super scenes? super fan? Yeah. yeah. Or, or, or booking I mean, shows, really, like I, said. I felt like I was like, I, I was a professional fan. You know, I would, I bought everything. I, you know, proselytized. I would book shows in college. I, you know, I played bass a, a little like I still have a bass I still like to play bass uh -huh. I never had a huge ambition to to do it you know and, and play guitar I mean I just would teach myself there's a funny thing about getting into punk rock um especially then and I don't know if people feel it now you're a little younger than me I'm 39 how old are you yeah I'm 33 so yeah we're 30. slightly slightly different generations Slight, slightly yeah. different but but not not too far off but there was something about the way you get into punk you always feel like you're too late there's something about the way, like things were just a little bit better. Oh yeah, before you showed up, <laughs> right? <laughs> or, or you're made to believe that. I don't think it's true at all. It's but totally, you're... it's totally the narrative that is created within the people that you start to interact with at shows. Because it's always like, you know, like that movie. I don't know if you watched that movie, American Hardcore. It, the the notion that you're left when you leave that is that like, hey, so you know, punk hardcore basically died in 1986, and it was like. <laughs> Dude, like, no, like I, I have a very rich experience, but yeah, no, I totally get what you're saying. And so there was something about me where I felt like I was too late to join a band, even though I was like in my teens, like that's when you're supposed to join a band. Yeah. There's something about that kind of quality of always feeling late, which was intimidating to me. Right. And right. so, and so I, um, but in a, and I was also like in that world, I was, um, always kind of the one who organized you know, um, I would help put together the show. I would put up the flyers. I, you know, I mean, that was just my temperament. Yeah. Well, you, so, you you always need the way that you're describing yourself definitely sounds like even though I personally played in bands and was always I was always the de facto businessman of the bands I played in. Right. But it was because I had the temperament that you're speaking of where it's like I enjoyed the organizational slash logistic aspect of the band. It was like, yeah. you know, you put me in a studio and I'm like, oh, it's the fucking worst. <laughs> but the but yeah, like uh, because you feel like you are contributing to something that is like obviously greater than yourself, but you still right. get that enjoyment out of it. So, yeah, that's I, I completely identify with what you're saying. And my great ambition was I always wanted to run a label. I, I thought that that would be the coolest thing ever, like to help people that I really liked. Did you um, what was that a was that a real trajectory that you were trying to uh, chase? Yeah. Okay. It, it was for a while. I mean, it was really hard because I was poor. I mean, there's, you have to get some capital to begin with. I mean, no one's rich doing it, obviously, right. but it, but yeah. it, you know, like even scraping together that first $500 for a, you know, for a seven inch pressing or something like that yeah. was, was really impossible for me to consider most of the time. So I went to school. The, the closest I got to this was I went to college kind of young. So I was 15 when I went to college. And then I um, was at this cool called si school called Simon's Rock. And that's where I met a lot of the other punks and we reinforced each other. And then, you know, like my friends were, you know, from DC. And then I really got immersed in the, the DC stuff. Mm hmm. And then I graduated, I transferred to Oberlin College in Ohio. And then I moved, I went to the University of Georgia to go to graduate school. And in Athens, Georgia, you know, the music scene is gigantic. You know, like everyone is in a band. Right. And then, and then I began to sort of, I began to work with the film festival to book bands. I was in graduate school, but I was really interested in this world. And I began to manage a band and book them. That was when I was really in the mode where I thought, I'm going to, start a label. I'm going to opening another venue, like a bar or something I was going to quit school. Uh -huh. Um, it, there was lots of things in, in that time period where I was considering, I was also considering public radio too. I mean, there was a lot of things that were in my mind. I knew I wasn't going to be doing what I was doing right. for school. <laughs> there was something about that, that I was very aware of, but I wasn't sure what. Yeah. And, um, and music was a huge part of it. That's not part of the sort of the narrative I talk about when I talk about me and my show is mm -hmm. particularly because I'm, I do, you know, public radio stuff now. Right. But like music was a huge thing that sort of dislodged me from the trajectory of being a, a scientist, which is what I was sort of training to be. One of the things that I was most concerned about was I would get a PhD and, you know, there's like five or six good postdocs a year and a couple hundred people apply for them. And if you end up in some tiny offshoot <laughs> of like the University of Biz Nebraska Biz or something, you know, yeah, 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 I mean, then you have to go there. That's the only one there was. And the thought 
of not seeing shows or not, not having bands come through or not having that type of culture was just, I could not imagine it. Mm-hmm. And that was one of the things that sort of took me out of that world. Yeah. It's so, it's so interesting. Cause it's like, yeah, you, you clearly don't have a choice yourself. You are ultimately ripped away from something that is so intensely important to you. Everybody that gets exposed to the, the culture that we're speaking about, they do have that fork in the road moment where it's like, dude, do I sit here and, you know, become this this thing that obviously my parents put forth to me? Or do I make that decision to, you know, really divert and and try to like build something on my own and bum a lot of people out in the process that have invested in my future financially? I mean, luckily my my mom was never like she was never that concerned about that. So, so I mean, she was when I dropped out of my PhD program, she was concerned. I wouldn't put it at that. <laughs> but she wasn't, but it wasn't like I, you know, I was lucky. You know, I got most of my stuff, like I paid for most of my stuff, like through scholarships and then through loans and what various other things. So mm-hmm. there wasn't a huge thing like that. But and and, be, and one of the things that what the hard part was was me, honestly, because I grew up um quite poor that I thought I had this education and this sort of um, you know, this skill. To, to do things you know I went to school early I, you know like that I was I was totally screwing up my life but it was mainly from me you know? right right <laughs> um just you know because when needs are not met it's harder to make those those choices I mean sometimes it's actually easier but but I, at, at the time all I wanted to have was money I was I was like things would be so much better right if, if I had money <laughs> and my kid you know like my future children could be fed Right. And things like that. And um, and so that's a, a lot of what motivated me in my early years was was a real ambition to not be poor anymore. Right. And so making that choice and not having a real plan was 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 really hard for me, actually. Sure. Well, because, yeah, you, not a lot of people have I mean, from the way that you're describing yourself, like there's obviously a, a, a 15 year old going to college like that shows some sense of maturity in my mind, just because everybody, yeah. everybody that I've surrounded myself with, like would never even think about that because they're like, oh, why would you do that? Yeah, I but, just wanted to be an adult so badly. Right, there was right. something about me that just I just wanted to be free. Sure. And it wasn't that things were bad at home or anything like that. I wanted agency. That right. was really important to me. Yeah. Um, and that was something that was in the ethic of the of the music that really resonated you're like totally. I love the idea of agency. I mean, I'm still. I know this is going to sound really weird. I'm still straight ed. I mean, Did, like twenty something years later. I mean, I, I was going. I was going to ask that, but I mean, it's, it's always <laughs> it's always one of those things where you never because I, I myself am straight edge, and I, I've I've been that since I started calling myself at 15 years old. But you never want to be like we're we're both <laughs> we're both grown ass men. Do we need to call ourselves straight edge? Like I guess you know, we do. I, I I don't I yeah. don't ever use the term. But it's like, but because, you know, we're among ourselves, I, I felt I, I would reveal that I, to everyone else. I just don't drink. I, I felt this great sense of control and I loved, I loved the culture of it. There was something about all that stuff, the, the drug culture of punk and the drug culture of youth culture that made me extremely uncomfortable. I came from a family of like extreme alcoholism Mm -hmm. and really detrimental like effects with substances and stuff. And, and, and I was going down that path too. I was like, I was an early drinker, an early active drinker. And then when I sort of found that world, um, I mean, partially because of a girl who he, like who I dated, who was straight edge, which is also a great gateway, per- perfect gateway right? <laughs> to the world. Yeah, and um, and the and the uh, notion of either veganism or vegetarianism that usually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that's the. I mean, the parts of it. I, I'm a I'm a pick or choose. I'm a, you know the American Catholic style um, straight edge. So like, I never really trucked too much with the the meat part. Sure. I, I went I went back because I was a terrible vegetarian. Right. But, but <laughs> sure, sure. I was the Snicker bar wheat thin variety of vegetarian. I was not healthy. But the not drinking no drugs thing was it's kind of fundamental to my being in a lot of ways. And I didn't. It's weird to admit that, but it was something. You know, when I was fifteen, I I sort of like came out straight edge. I don't know how to describe that to people who weren't there at the time, but it it's like it was important to me to realize that that was who I was and my discomfort with that in the world and with that amongst my friends was um was so fundamental to to my being the later stages so this was kind of 1990 mm-hmm. the, it was the later stages of that that was 
you know, violent and, oh yeah, you know, and, and, you know, and I was never judgmental. It was my choice, you know, and I love bars. Oh my God, I love bars. I love hanging out in bars. Right, right. <laughs> and it was because I had this ability to kind of, I get contact high. I like, if I'm around drunk people, I feel drunk. Yeah. You know, I don't need to be. Totally. I don't need to, I don't need to consume that. I, I get it just by, by osmosis. <laughs> exactly. And so there's a part of me, like, I love you know, I, I'm happy with people just being happy. But for me, it was like it was something I realized how uncomfortable I was with it. And, and I've never looked back. And now it's been whatever, fuck, 20, 20 <laughs> 24 years. You know? yeah. Well, it, it's interesting. I, I do think the, the notion of feeling that that element of I want to press fast forward on my life because I want to, like, get things started. I do mm-hmm. think that there. There, there is this this idea that I, I notice with it. Like my wife is a high school English teacher, and occasionally I go in to speak to her students, and there always is this element of, of kids feeling like they're trapped because they can't start whatever it is they want to start. Um, but it's like you know, no, you can like, dude, you want to you want to take photos at your local show, like you can do that right now, or you want to you know be a BMX rider, like you can do that now. There's so many things that you can start now, but because of the the trappings in which you're set in, there's definitely that oppressive feeling. And so I could easily understand why you were like, hey, yeah, being straight edge and going to college. Yeah, I need that immediately. Like this is getting right. me to that spot I need to be. Yeah, I I, I definitely need it. I, I had this habit until really recently of just sort of burning everything to the ground every couple of years and starting over. And it was really important to me. And so like was I saw my path didn't look good in high school. And that's what motivated me to leave. And then I saw the limitations of being at Simon's Rock, which is a great liberal arts school. I loved it. I love all the people there. There's still all my best friends were from there. But I was trying to be a scientist and there wasn't, it was, you know, it was mainly a liberal arts school. And so that's when I went to Oberlin and I just sort of restarted. And every two years, I basically kind of restarted my life until I found the thing that I really love, which allowed me to do kind of all the things I love at once, which was um, work in public radio. Right. And so it, it took me a long, a long time to figure out, you know, where, where I felt comfortable, but I was always driving forward to something, you know, I was never happy with what was going on. In sure. a, in a way. Yeah. With the, with the path that was set forth. And so then the, uh, obviously like you were alluding to earlier and it's obviously the case with the, the radio show you have now, you know, public radio is what you, you decided to pursue more so than the, the fact that, you know, music was obviously there and you trying to, you know, manage bands and open yeah. venues and stuff like that. Um, even without you saying that you were into punk, like listening, listening to the radio show and everything that you've done to kind of build it to where it is, is so emblematic of like, dude, there has to like, I, like I was saying earlier, it's like, I was like, there has to be some sort of root somewhere at this because they're, <laughs> because I, I look at it like this, like people always equate, you know, DIY culture. Cause even though that term has been appropriated a million times over and there's a television network based around it, <laughs> right. you know, people often equate, you know, Oh, it's like being in independent music is kind of, you know, similar to like the startup culture of like, you know, Silicon Valley and everything. But the thing that I always go back on with that, where I'm like, well, no, because the notion of doing something from the culture that we've come from, there's never been any sort of financial plan. It's like, oh, yeah, like I'm going to start a band because I'm going to make money out of it. What do you know? Right. But the technology world, it's like, yeah, so I'm going to do this thing. And then like a year and a half later, Yahoo's going to buy it. Right. That's that's it. Right. <laughs> and so the the radio show just seems to be such a, a direct correlation between that. And I'm sure that like were those principles kind of like in your head and at the forefront when you started to do get into public radio, like, and being oh, able yeah. to like, I mean, cause you don't go into public radio cause you think you're going to make money. That's right. for sure. <laughs> sure. So there's that. I mean, I, I felt like I knew after all that time of like trying to speed everything up, I felt like I knew the answer was that if I could make it my job to study new things every single day, I would never be bored. And that was the sort of the nature. And I didn't even know that was journalism. You know, to me, it was working in public radio. And, and the, two, the two things that I wanted was I wanted a, a good community and I wanted that constant change, you know. And, and the nature, what I, also the nature of public radio is you kind of do everything. If you work at a good station, you know, you, you, you fix things, you, um, you record things, you, you know, edit, you, you know, like patch the ISDN. You, you know what I mean? You do everything. Right. And that, that, that I love. I, mean, I never want to get rid of um, the grunt work because that, that's part of the soul of the work and, to me. And then the, the other thing is um, you want to look left and look right and make sure that you're working next to people that are uh, good people. And so that was really 
uh, important to me too. And so I, um, you know, the, the world of, of public radio is, and, and now I guess podcasting, which is now I've become a podcaster yeah, yeah. more than a public radio person, Sure, but it, it's, um, it's a good world because there is a mission there and it runs through everything, but you don't need to hear it every moment. And that was the thing. That's what's great about punk too, is that you don't have to be screaming about ethics yeah. <laughs> to have it come through. You live the ethic and then you do the thing that's the art. And that's important to me. And so like when I listen to bad, what I consider to be bad public radio is when you hear the mission of public radio, like two on the surface. And that's when you get, where you feel like you're being hectored right. and, you know, and bored by, by something, by some mission driven statement. So to me, it was to, the idea was to create entertainment, but live the ethic. And sure. I'm a big uh, believer in that. But I always, the, but the, the part of me that wanted to, you know, start a label is still here because I basically started a label. Right, you do. Podcasting <laughs> label. <laughs> <laughs> no, totally. And that, that's what it was like when you were, you know, putting Radiotopia together and stuff like right. that. It was, it was, I mean, it, like I said, just being involved for in the music industry for as long as I have, like working at record labels and doing all of the things that y- you were talking about you wanted to be involved in, but then seeing on the flip side where it's like, I look at what you're doing and I'm like, oh man, that's rad. That's exactly that's exactly what you're doing. You're putting out records, except you're putting them out on a weekly basis, except not physically producing anything. <laughs> right, right. But but the whole idea of, of forming some kind of collective that had a had a shared aesthetic that had this, um, you know, curatorial kind of nature to it, and also you know, like I fundraise for them, and um, and uh, we'll probably fundraise collectively. I've proven that I could fundraise well on my own and that, and I don't even know what the limit of what we can raise is, but I, I you know, I, I don't, this is not like any, there's no martyrdom here. This is exactly what I want to do. But like, I take the financial hit for us to raise money together <laughs> yeah. is basically it is what I'm trying to say here. Totally. And so I can't think of another way to do it. I, I just like, I, I just, if we couldn't, if I couldn't help them, sustain and find their audience like a part of me is hopeful that in the end you know we all do well we maybe it's an investment that you know that my show gets back over time but the thing is is like we're doing fine and so and we can raise more money for everyone and everyone can put greater work out in the world and and um and that makes it better for everybody right and so that part is like is still that collectivist spirit of these of these labels that were that were never that are not meant to screw anyone over and they're they're about us doing this together and 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 you know working on this stuff and and making the culture richer that is definitely the ethic of radiotopia for sure yeah no it's i mean it's it's awesome it's awesome to see that just the the correlation in and, and i'm sure you experience this as well in regards to um you know your professional life when you do run across a person that that has that bed of understanding of what we're talking about you immediately can like walk into their house and have 900 things to talk about and have these shared experiences and be like oh yeah i was in that same room as you whereas mm-hmm another person that doesn't have the context for that, you have to kind of f- search more for it. Not to say that it's like, oh, people that have been privy and lucky enough to experience what we've experienced from an independent music thing uh, right. are, are completely worthless. <laughs> but you just have, you, there's, there's that idea of, you have to search harder for those kind of common threads to pull. Whereas this, you can just be like, oh yeah, yeah, like, uh, sure. Like, I mean, if I live by you, you would have probably been like, oh yeah, like come over to my place and like, well, we can do this interview face to face like <laughs> oh yeah sure i mean that's why that's why i mean I, I get a few requests it's hard for me to always fit them in but yeah. i just liked i was like i could talk about music i never talk no one ever talks to me about music <laughs> totally totally <laughs> Every, awesome. right right and that, that, that's Everyone what wants to talk about kickstarter right <laughs> dude how do you raise so much money that's incredible exactly yeah, yeah totally that's <laughs> i mean i love doing 99 percent invisible i love like the subjects I love, the team I work with, um, it's really like a dream come true to me. It's funny to me, you know, I've been a public radio producer for a long time. I've always felt I was good. Like, I, I you know, like it's like I've always felt like I was doing a good job. Mm-hmm. No one cared until I made money. <laughs> That's just the way it is. It's and true. I, and, and the thing is, is that that is okay because I put in the time. It just is a, it's just a hook to make people interested 
I mean, people. I, I don't want to say like my fans. They they care. I mean, yeah. but it was like nobody wrote about the show. Like nobody. It wasn't like a presence in the world to a lot of people right. until like it, it got a certain thing. My fans don't give a shit. They they're just fans. You know, like the, they're the, they're the greatest. Yeah, and they support us. You know, like they're they're everything. But like when people, I didn't realize that the first Kickstarter campaign would be a PR thing. Like to me, it was just a tool. I was just going broke, and I didn't know how to do it. Right. And this seemed like a good idea. And I think I had this feeling I had enough support to make it work. But it was never this calculation that I would be known as the podcast Kickstarter guy. Like right. that, I did not think that that was going to be a part of it. Yeah. And I didn't think that it was going to be successful. And the second one, I was so amazed by the second one, too. You know, and and um, and I don't know. And the, the part of me that wants to take advantage of it is 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 not out of um, it's not that I just feel like it's lucky and I have to just take advantage while it's there. Part of it has to do with this combination of knowing that it's lucky, but also knowing that, like, I was good before. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I know that this is ephemeral. And so I want to take advantage of it when I can to build something like Radiotopia, to, like, um, take the show weekly, to, you know, do all these things while people care. Um, it, it, it's really important to me. And and, and what, was, what was the most amazing part of that journey was that, as much as I had sort of gotten away from the world of caring about business um, and, and making decisions that were pretty deleterious to my future financial success mm-hmm. most of my life, um, I've actually kind of enjoyed the business part of it. Like I kind of like it. It's like it's a problem to solve. Um, and and to me, as long as your goal is sustainability, not fortune – you know, right. Then there's something about that. That's really, I just really love. Well, it, and, it, and I did not know that, like, that was something I was like totally surprised by. Sure. No, you, you learned through that process. I mean, yeah. I think, I think it's, it's completely, uh, you know, the same idea as what, you know, we've seen with bands that have, you know, risen and fall where it's like the, the bands that, that do it quote unquote, right. Where it's like, you know, yeah, they hit some sort of apex of popularity, and then, you know, people that have never been at the shows are at the shows now. Um, and then it's about what they do at that very point where it's like they if they realize that this is not going to last forever <laughs> because they have that idea of like, OK, let's let's keep doing what we're doing. And of course, we'll stretch ourselves creatively. And, you know, we we're afforded these opportunities that we can't say no to. But to hopefully stretch this out to where it's like, yeah, we can be doing it, you know, whatever, 10 years down the line. Cause I mean, obviously no one wants to see, you know, a 65 year old, uh, punk band, even though every band is doing that now. <laughs> I, I think they do. I think you're wrong. <laughs> no, it, it's true. I, I, yeah, maybe, maybe I think he's speaking from personal experience, yeah, No, <laughs> but, but there, yeah, there's definitely the notion of, of, of just trying to, yeah, like strike while the iron's hot, but never, uh, yeah, never overextending yourself to where it's like, oh yeah, this seems like what you're doing, what the core thing that you were doing just seems like a, a hollow shell of what it was before you know yeah just play the long game if you can you know like but to me it's like we're building up to sort of to keep doing this as long as as long as we can and if we get bored we stop yeah know? right <laughs> there, um, you know, that's okay too yeah that's but, fine. I, but that was something like i'd never really put together like i had always admired the ethic of like <clears throat> ian mckay and how he ran discord and stuff like that i never really thought especially back then I never really thought of him as being like, just like he's a savvy businessman. You yep. know, that $5 show thing was not just, I mean, it was, it was smart. It fit into his, you know, ethic. It was, you know, like all these sorts of things, but also it was like, that was good business. Mm-hmm. It, it made sense. I, I, I like, I like that. Right. <laughs> Are there a lot of people in public radio that do have similar backgrounds in regards to like being into, you know, punk and hardcore and that sort of uh, thread? Like, they be- say there was an overwhelming number. There's a, there's a few. You, okay. you, I mean, you run across them. And also, as you get older, it's less of a defining. Like, I'm much more defined by public radio than I am by that. By it, sure. And so, like, it it comes up less, you know, right. in conversation. But like, I know, like Alex Goldman, who's on OTM. Uh, on the media uh-huh. like uh he has a real like ex- he's a massive vinyl collection that is his wife actually runs a tumblr that's like her going through his record oh i 100 percent follow that tumblr that's hilarious. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. And so i know alex and but he is a, he is a weird taste he's like all over the map like i've always part of me had always admired those people that liked all kinds of music i'm just not I'm not one of them. You, I, you stayed I, in your lane. Yeah, I did. Yeah, totally. <laughs> and so, um, and so there's, there's him and, 
and um, and then also Nate DeMeo who who does the, the Memory Palace. Memory Palace, yeah. Um, I, I was driving with him, and he just kind of like he he had he had he picked me up because we were going to some conference together in L.A. And he's a friend of mine, and uh, and you could tell like we have very similar trajectories. And he was you know like some like Quicksand comes on his MP3 player, and he was like, oh. "I bet you you were really into Quicksand." <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, I think you got me nailed on that one." You so know? so good, <laughs> and so you know stuff like that. So like you, you do recognize uh, you 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 see each other. It's, it's like the years kind of shaded a little bit as you get you know softer and you know rounder. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and you start thinking about kids and other stuff more, but but like once you get past it, you realize that there's there's a lot of shared history for yeah. a lot of people. No, totally, and that's it's like the building blocks that it, it's that your your life is built upon. You know, it's you, you look at the foundation that you just you you can't help but always look back at that and be like, man, that's so like you know, if that wasn't there, like where would I have gone? You know? I know. I'm. It is it is so fundamental to who I, who I am? Music was my identity, and and giving me strength and giving me a community when I really felt alone. It it was um it was a um, yeah it was amazing to me. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, it, to me at the time. I mean, now because I have kids and I work like all the time. Right. I don't I don't really go to shows anymore. Mm-hmm. But I remember thinking back about 10 years ago if i didn't go to shows anymore i just you might as well just kill me it's just like there's no fucking point to live in right and and i really had that feeling i was just like why bother being alive and um and now like i don't miss it at all <laughs> like yeah like i i get it a different way like i get my joy a different way i still love the music and stuff but but i get my joy a different way so something that that seems so uh it literally cannot be ripped apart from you it's like well like clearly these other things have filled my space and you right. know that's a, that's an okay thing because you, you have twin sons right I do, yeah. Um, seven. Okay, they're both seven. Yeah. Well, obviously, they're twins. Because um, <laughs> I, I have a three-year-old son, and it's one of those things where um, have you seen that or heard of that documentary called "The Other F Word"? I've I've seen the trailer for it. Okay, but I, have yeah. not, I have not seen it yet. Yeah, it's. I mean, it, it's it's a cool movie. It's definitely worth checking out, especially you know knowing what you know. It is one of those things that constantly uh, is on my mind in regards to like, okay, well, once once my little dude grows up to be that age where he starts to get into stuff that um, I'm either i i don't care about or i don't have an awareness about um you know what am i going to do does do the uh you know sort of like uh punk ethics kind of you know filter through your 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 parenting lens as well as far as like oh wow like i i should foster independence or uh you know how how does that kind of play itself out yeah i mean i think fostering independence is a big part of it and you know choosing your path is a big part of it and also just being smart like i was really you know the things i loved about punk culture was that it wasn't the, the parts that i've chose to align myself with it wasn't dumb you know mm-hmm. i mean there was plenty of you know thug you know punk <laughs> bands you know what i mean later on well, especially later on right <laughs> that's my like shaking my hand at you know fist at the youngins but but like to me it was like the quintessential punks were like were minor threat and dead kennedys and stuff like you were like the politics was there the thought was there and the, you know it was really smart and fun and it was angry too but it had a point of view and so, you know, we te- try to teach them all that stuff about, you know, caring about people and social justice and things like that. But um, in, in, in terms of their taste, you know, you try to shape that as much as you can. But as I've <laughs> learned, and you will learn soon, <laughs> there's like, there's nothing you can do. No. It's like I, I used to have this this opinion of nature and nurture that was kind of 50-50 that you, you know, but I feel like my kids were just wired to some way and you're just there to keep them from being sociopaths that's about it totally and also through their through their eyes i begin to appreciate um different culture differently because their joy in it is really infectious yeah and so our favorite band that we listen to like i've tried different little things that they don't they don't really uh dig the hard stuff too much but they love matt and kim I oh, okay. love Matt and Kim. Okay, and and I don't think I would have given a whole lot of thought to Matt and Kim back in the day, but <laughs> right, but like, but I, but now I love them. I'm just like, I'm just like, it's our kid, it's our family music, you know that sort of thing. Like they love that type of stuff. I mean, it's like aggressive and poppy. It has moments that it's just catchy as hell. Yeah, and like, and so like that is like that's their favorite band that we all listen to and dance around with t- together. Right. If I put on something like really guitar heavy. Uh, Bob Mould's new record just oh, came sure. out. Yep. And um and so I've been playing that vinyl in the house a lot. They do not care for that. At all. No. 
<laughs> this is like uh, I can't dance to this at all. <laughs> exactly. They really. It's really about dancing to them <laughs> right. at this point. And so, um, but that's cool. I I think it's terrible to you know force your kids into certain things. But they they so they find the things they like. And, yeah, totally. And that, I, and that and that's plenty. You know. I know you. You. I always look at at the parents that you know dress dress their kids um, like the lifestyle they want them to embody in regards <laughs> right. to like oh here's your you know your your little cute jean jacket with band patches or whatever and it's <laughs> like like that's cute like I get it from an aesthetic purpose but then it's like at, at some point they're gonna look back at those pictures and be like hey mom dad like why did you do that to me like I look <laughs> stupid. I'm not into Gorilla Biscuits. I'm not in. <laughs> like, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. The the last thing I want to hit on before I left you was the um, it, it, something that, I mean, in, in speaking to you now, not like I expected your voice to be drastically different than what gets portrayed on the radio, but mm. there's definitely an element of the same way that I equate a person putting on their quote unquote radio voice versus yeah. the person, you know, like when a band plays on stage, like the. Oh, uh, t- totally. Yeah. I totally agree with that. I mean, th- this is the thing. So, like, my voice is basically. Basically, is basically my voice, but it's like I breathe different. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let me let me try to do it here. <laughs> this is ninety nine percent invisible. I'm Roman Mars, and then I I have this. I keep my chest up higher. I mean, it's basically singing. It's a performance, mm-hmm. and so whenever a I can't do it forever. You know, like I can't <laughs> just like you can't scream right. You know, for you know through a party. Uh, you know, like it, it's the same, it's exact same thing. And so every once in a while when people say you sound different, it's just, it's like, I was like, yeah, but I don't know. Does Mick Jagger, you think Mick Jagger talks like he sing? <laughs> I mean, to me, it's a performance. Yeah. And I, and I, and I like the performance aspect of it. Like it's, it's, it's important. Um, and uh, it's a part of my voice, but it's, it's a little bit, it's a little bit rounder. It's a little bit um, bigger I don't really pitch it all that different, but I, you know, I, I just, there's something about the breathing that makes it, um, smoother and calmer. Right. And, um, but it, it's definitely, it's an aspect, it's a character. Yeah. It's, and I think you, you probably have that same experience, um, singing in a band. Yeah. You, you know, it's like, it is you, but it's, it's like you height, like the different parts of you heightened in these different ways. Totally. Um, and so, um, but it's weird. Uh, I, I think, I think the nature of public radio in particular, people expect you to be you. Um, there, it, it, it gives the illusion of non-performance, even though it's totally performative. Sure. Um, uh, well, yeah, you ha- that, that's interesting. You def- it's the, the notion of you have to be, quote unquote, uh, authentic as you possibly are as a human being because this is, the f- this is what the format demands. We right. want you we right, don't want, right, right, right. yeah. We don't want shock jock morning AM radio, dude. Right, like, <laughs> right, right. But I, I like the performance of it a little bit. I mean, yeah. it makes it, 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 it brings it. Well, it, it's just good. It just sounds better. Like I wanted the voice that I wanted to. That's the voice I wanted to present. Yeah. And then, um, but also that's the person I wanted to to be, which is slightly different than the person I am, or it's the person I aspire to be. Sure. You know, I, I'm not a, someone who, who can always notice every little thing in the built environment and be curious about it. I'm not the person that can read every plaque, but th- that's the person I want to be. Um, there's an aspirational quality to the show, to the tone, to the, the level of understanding, which is something that you get after researching something for a number of weeks. And then at first you have an opinion about it in one way. And then you realize that that kind of there's two sides to this and there's, you know, probably reason things are the way they are. And um, those things, all that stuff is is about um, um, us sort of appreciating the world differently and me appreciating my role in it and, and, and and understanding and trying to be that person that cares, you know? Um, Well, I think, I think a important component of the show as well is like you're the notion of, 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 you know, as cliched as it sounds like obviously seeing the world through, you know, different eyes where it's like, you know, a a skateboarder clearly is going to look at the world differently than your average, uh, you know, person walking to work. Um, and it's like that to me, that question, that fundamental question that you ask is something that isn't inherently hardwired in many people until they either are forced to do so through either some cultural awakening or something. They go to an art exhibit and are like, oh, this is what I should be paying attention to. Mm-hmm. Um, or, like I said, they're, they're forced to buy, you know, the art that they start to consume and that they start to, you know, be more aware of. And it's like that's you're just presenting a fundamental question that I believe a lot of people don't ask of themselves immediately. Yeah. I mean, but, but it's also like it's something that I 
don't ask of myself all that immediately all, all the time either. Yeah. And so it's definitely uh, something, it's a muscle, you know, you have to turn it on, you have to pay attention, you have to, you have to, um, you know, present it to people in a good and interesting way, you know? And then the, my favorite stories on the show are ones where it's not so much that you, you know, like I really like it if you would take that story and you'd retell it and you, it really gets into your head and you begin to see the world differently based on that one thing. But my favorite effect would be for you to hear some story about, you know, like, anti-skateboard you know whatever is and 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 then you begin to see some kind of analog of that everywhere or something else you begin to notice sidewalk stamps all of a sudden because you'd never looked down before or you even begin to notice um you know utility spray paint markings because you'd never noticed them if you take that and just like it becomes the way you see the world in all things not just the things that i've talked about Mm -hmm. that it that is really those those stories of people when they send me things, those make me really really happy. Yeah, because um, because that's what the show has done for me. It's it's made me that that type of person, um, and and I like that world. Like and 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 I I like I like feeling optimistic about the way things are problems are solved. Um, um, there's something about that that's really uh, you know nice to me and and when i see design in the world that's that's done smartly i realize that there's lots of like unknown designers and smart people in the world making our lives better and that's that's, that was something i never really felt as a kid certainly part of um the punk stuff i I remember once my uh father who i didn't grow up with my father but i I would see him Mm -hmm. um every you know uh every once in a while and he saw some mixtape that i'd made and you read the you, you know you read the titles of these songs and they they really all just sound negative. You know? like oh, they, totally. <laughs> they're just like so fucked up. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know, too, like too, everything. Too drunk to fuck. Yeah, exactly. okay, cool. They right. all are horrible. Right. But to me, that music was super positive to me. It just it made me happy. It made me strong. It made me think about things. It like it, that was the effect that that world it had on me. It was, and not to mention the fact that it it has a real nihilistic. Um, sound to it and i guess there's aspects of of early punk and and stuff that are very nihilistic but to me that was it was extremely thoughtful and purposeful like i'm glad i came in up in the hardcore era that really had um an ethic that was that was it was different about trying to be underground and and the and the sort of the strength of being underground was was part of it instead of the uh, you know the late 70s punk which is all about taking over the world which i think has its own sort of great qualities to it too sure but there was something about the underground and ethic that i that i really gravitated towards well it, so, it, it's it's so interesting i like the the point that you you were making right there in regards to the it was a person on the outside looking at the stuff like you're looking at a mixtape or like i told i 100 percent remember like going into like my freshman year of high school and like doing a presentation um, on, I can't even remember exactly what it was, but I, I decided to play a propaganda song <laughs> and, and it was one of those things where it was like, I could not, I wouldn't have enough time in my 10 minute presentation to give them the context for this, <laughs> why this band wrote this song. But it was like, I just felt, even though it, uh, a person on the outside would look at this and be like, wow, that song was pretty brutal and negative. And I was like, no, but this is great. But it's like, how yeah. do I explain that to you? It's just a real pleasure in, in like trying to figure out the world, presenting it, being angry about it, like screaming about it. Right. But like, but having a good contest and like a foundation, it's just like foundational. Like it, it gives you like support, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I used to love propaganda. <laughs> <laughs> I, I still, I still have that with the ten inch of. Um, oh, the I can't remember what they they did the. Uh, well, they did a split with uh, I Spy, if I'm not mistaken, on a ten inch. Yes. Yep. That's yeah. the one I have. Oh, yeah. sp- you'd be glad to know that propaganda is still 100 percent alive and kicking, and still really, really good live. Wow. Well, that's yeah. Good to know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, let me put it this way. I, my door is open to you. Anytime you are remotely curious about a band, you can just email me and I'll be like, oh, yeah, Roman, here's here's what they got going on now, dude. Still alive. <laughs> still, <laughs> yeah, still alive, still kicking. Well, I, I really, really appreciate your time, Roman. This has been super fun for me to uh, yeah get to know your, your roots from that perspective. Because, yeah, I don't think, like you said, you don't, no one asks you about this. <laughs> yeah, no one, no one really does. I mean, no one knows to ask. I remember I put in little things. I remember the uh, when we did one about beer, and I said I'm a person just like you, but I don't actually drink beer. And oh. like two people were like, 
Wait a minute. Hold the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, did was that just a minor threat homage there? <laughs> yeah. And so it was really, you know, so there's little things like that. So every once in a while when I when I put one of those in and people respond, it makes me really happy. Dude, so, it's so yeah, it's so pr- you, you were yeah, you were literally like just putting these little breadcrumbs like, "Hey, let's see if someone can find this one." Exactly. <laughs> That's per it like it doesn't undermine my credibility as a public radio uh you know host uh but at the same time it will uh, this could boost my punk cred if someone recognizes this <laughs> that's exactly right that's <laughs> well like I said I really appreciate this and thank you so much for wanting to do this my pleasure so there you go how about that interview so stoked and uh, yeah now we're uh, email buddies and it's awesome you know I sent him some free records to check out because uh you know he should be keeping up with music as well so anyways. His podcast, 99% Invisible, is crucial listening, so do that. And remember, visit thenativesound.com for awesome releases from Vow and Koji, and you can get 10% off thenativesound.com, 100 words in the coupon code box, and you will, you'll get great music. You, you can't say no to that, because it, great releases on vinyl. I just get so excited when labels decide that this thing, this podcast, is worth investing in, and I want to make sure that you, in turn, invest in other independent productions. Anyways, the producer for this episode, as always, is Tom Richfield. Visit 100 Words Podcast. Email the show, 100wordspodcast at gmail.com. I've been getting a lot of feedback recently, and I, I will get back to you, I promise. But thank you so much for listening, and until next week, be safe, everybody. Thank you.